Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Brooke Thomas, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Vanessa Scotto. On the show, we're talking about being on the embodied spiritual path, and what does that actually mean? What is a real evolution of our lives? How do we ultimately embrace everything, the beauty and crazy, the joys and the messes, the bliss and the grit that is a human life? So we are very recently back from a weekend retreat with Matt Kahn at Multiversity 1440 in California, which is gorgeous, by the way. And this talk was recorded really pretty much immediately after we returned home and we were in deep digestion mode, which we continued to be. However, from through the fog of integration, we brought forward just a few of the threads that were really resonant for us in this weekend that we found for both of us really remarkably transformative and also powerful. And much of what made it that way was the time to be steeped in Matt's presence, which demonstrates what it feels like when everything is truly and wholeheartedly welcomed. And being with him and experiencing a space where really actually nothing gets pushed away shook something loose where we were deeply immersed in a state of love. So what happens when you can no longer find your shame, your guilt, your pain? What does life look and feel like post-healing? If you're enjoying the show, we would be delighted if you left a review on iTunes or on our Facebook page, which is Bliss and Grit. You can also head over to the website and subscribe to get our weekly digest of the resources that we're currently loving. We send that out every Friday. And if you want to become a supporting member and get all the support and benefits that we offer for that, including surprise treatsies that we drop from time to time, like this time we just gave to the people in the private forum some of the notes that we took from the Matt Con retreat and sometimes we'll have pop-up meditations, things like that. Anyway, that's all over at patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. The last thing, if you haven't been here before, we do swear sometimes. So if you're in company that does not need to hear that, you can wear headphones. Okay, here we go. Hi, Brooke. Hello, beautiful. Okay, all of you. Well, this is being recorded pretty much immediately after we just finished spending a weekend with Matt Kahn in Santa Cruz at the amazing 1440, by the way. And um, Brooke and I just got home. I got in last night. Brooke got in like three hours ago. So (laughs) red eye zone out. Yeah. So you're getting us fresh off of the experience and, and what an experience it was. And as we were chatting before the recording about like, well, what will we talk about? Um, I've never seen Brooke and I more at a loss for words. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. And that's just what it's like, because the state that we're experiencing is something that uh, goes beyond words. However, we thought it'd be really fun to see if it was at all possible to try to articulate and transmit to all of you some of what we got out of this experience. Mm. So maybe we can just start with the kind of state of being and state of mind that we went through. I mean, there were some really interesting quotes and some really interesting teaching, some of which I think we could do justice to others like just go see Matt Kahn. There's no <laughs> <Yeah>. point in, <laughs> in general, <laughs> just go I see trying. Matt Kahn. But yes. yeah, I mean, one of the things that's so clear after sitting with Matt Kahn for a weekend, I think you and I both knew this already, Brooke, but sometimes we try to convey this to all of you is it is tremendously impactful. And I would almost dare say important, though that seems to be a value judgment, but very impactful to go sit with teachers because any of the words that we try to convey from Matt will only ever carry like a sliver of the experience. And I think 
probably so much of what went on for us, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brooke, sitting there was really happening on an energetic level. Oh, to- I mean, totally. For that whole room, it was powerfully energetic. So it's the land where words don't live, which makes podcasting a clumsy tool. <laughs> right. And Matt found plenty of words. Oh, yeah. There were lots and of yet, words. <laughs> it's, for example, one I gave an extremely powerful, extremely powerful talk on forgiveness. And I don't know if we were to convey that talk, if the power of it would be conveyed. No. Because while he's doing it, it's the energy yeah. that your body is like attuning to and then beginning to resonate with that created such a like, boom, this, everything kind of an experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can just tell a little bit about what it was like for me leading up to this retreat and through it. And maybe you could do the same. Yeah, that sounds good. And it will be like you said, like, it'll be this weird, funny, (laughs) not quite thing, but um, it'll point to something. Yeah, and maybe some of the energy can trickle through for all of your all of your goodness for everyone listening. Okay. So, I went to San Francisco a few days before the retreat. And you all know, I mean, you listen to us probably weekly. This may be the first time you're tuning in, but many of you know us really well by now. So, you you know, you know we are very alive with our unfolding path. You know, we're in very deep relationship with it. So, Everything that happened this weekend, it, there was other things that were arriving before. So I, I, I get to the retreat and I meet Brooke on Thursday. And the first thing I'm talking about with Brooke is, I don't think we need to hold on to our pain anymore. But it's crystal clear. That's the interesting thing about revelation as opposed to an intellectualization. I got this sense, and this further deepened for me when I was driving home, Brooke. I never even told you this part because we haven't seen each other since we left the retreat. But I got this sense that there's a way in which we're holding on to a sense of identity that we know. I think we all can relate to that. This is who I am. But what began to clarify for me is that we often identify with the painful aspects of ourselves more than anything else, which I think we all also can sort of know when we bond with people or intimacy. We almost always talk about, oh, I shared this painful feeling I had or I shared this painful story I had. And when we think about ourselves in this very human way where we want to kind of feel special and unique and, and, you know, like something or somebody, I noticed that it's our overcoming of tragedy that can make us feel different. It's our, it's the pain itself that we've been through. It's the way we think, which is often loaded with our pain that makes us feel like we are who we are. Is this making sense so far? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So I had this feeling like we actually don't need to hold on to this. I, I was giving Brooke the, um, the description, uh, from Jill Bolte Taylor that some of you may have listened to a stroke of insight. We've shared her Ted talk before, but she was either a neuroscientist or a neuroanatomist, but I think neuroscientist. And she was sharing that when you get emotionally triggered by something for 15 seconds, that emotional thing will cascade through your body. So if it's anger, it's like all of the circuitry of anger will light up for 15 seconds. But then after that, in order for anger to stay in place, the mind has to tell a story again. It has to sort of reignite that circuit. And I got the sense that that's what we're always doing. Mm -hmm. Like reigniting the circuit of this is who Vanessa is. And oftentimes as it is us creating our identity, it's based on the stories of our life. It's based on narratives. It's based on memory. And, and those seem to be most loaded with pain and doubt and fear and all of those common human experiences. Maybe, maybe in some ways, simply because the brain stores, uh, more importance to painful memories. Like that's how it like stores memory, the really intense ones. So I'm driving home from the retreat 
And I'm thinking about it. And I also have this revelation that when you really enjoy, like when you and I are really laughing on retreat and we're in joy, you're not a separate self. Mm -hmm. There's no separation in joy. We're laughing and laughing and Vanessa's no different than Brooke and Brooke's no different than Vanessa and the energy merges. I mean, in contentment and in joy, there's really this state of connection Mm -hmm. that can happen with everything. That's why, you know, the term ecstasy means to stand outside of oneself. It's an uncontained experience. So I thought, of course, if you want to define yourself as a self, it can't, you can't be in contentment all the time. You can't be in joy. You have to have this other thing that seems definable and separate. Mm -hmm. So this is the background thoughts that were coming before and sort of washing over me after, but it happened in the retreat. And I don't even know exactly where it happened or when it happened. Matt was offering teachings on love. That's really Matt's, one of Matt's gifts to the world is he loves and he aims to help us all overcome the the habit of low confidence that protects us from or prevents us from seeing our nature. And so somewhere in him teaching us this mantra, he had offered, thank God I'm me. And into forgiveness, I don't know, somewhere in those days, he asked us a question like, well, what are you most ashamed of about yourself? Like reflect on it. And all of a sudden I couldn't find it anymore. <laughs> like this thing that's always there, always I always can point to something bad about me. I always can point to some feeling of guilt because someone's disappointed. I mean, I can always point to something. And all of a sudden, it was like I was manufacturing stories, but actually not feeling anything. And so everything kept crumbling under the light of awareness as like dust, meaningless. And it was the most unusual experience. It's still here right now. I don't know, you know what will become of it, but is the most unusual experience because I saw exactly what had begun like bubbling up in my, in my consciousness, which was, holy shit, we don't need this yeah, at all. So I think that was probably the most powerful experience I took from everything. I mean, there was so much we could start to say and we can start to... It's so impossible to convey, right? Like what's most powerful or... When we were talking before, you were saying, you know, like this was one of those weekends um, where it's like, we're not, we're not coming, we're not coming back from this trip, right? Like this is... (laughs) um, and you were saying that we all have those experiences in our lives, but we don't, we don't even have to make them energetic or mystical or about a spiritual path. Like we all can look in our lives and think about the moment when everything was different. You know, like you were the person who you were and then the moment occurred, whether it was a moment of clarity, you know, like I need to get sober. I need to leave this relationship. Um, I really want to be a teacher. Fuck it. I'm going to leave my career and go become a teacher. Like something dawns. And you can't unsee it. Mm -hmm. And your life trajectory is forever changed after the moment of epiphany. And um, this was one of those weekends for us. And and that's powerful and very fresh. Like we're still in the kind of stoned space. And I don't mean that in the like conventional spiritual bypass way. I just mean that like there's a lot moving through the Mm -hmm. system. There's a lot. Um, on an energetic level, as kooky as it sounds, like rewiring itself. And so, um, it will continue to unfold. Like we can't, we can't grab hold of it so neatly <laughs> as much as that would make for a super tidy show. You know, that's not what's up. It's very hard to convey. I mean, for me, it, like you and I both had that. And it's one of the reasons why our last episode is what if nothing's a problem is because that's been really, really landing for me as a lived experience, you know, so powerful, so powerful. And then to show up on this weekend that we planned a long time ago, where, I mean, one of the things that I appreciated the most about Matt was that he, It was really like watching a very, very high level, like ultimate world championship level jujitsu master of energy where nothing is resisted. 
everything is welcomed. You know, like if you picture jujitsu, which is such beautiful movement, you know, it's like nobody pushes away, right? Like everything is like a move towards and roll with, and then you come out of the roll and, you know, that's the action of the movement. Nothing is against. And the way he spoke, if he was speaking to the whole group or if he spoke to an uh, individual person who had asked a question, you really got to, if, you know, for me, I got this beautiful imprint of like, oh my God, this is what it feels like when really everything is welcomed. Nothing is a problem. It's all it's all a uh, yes, welcome here. And not in the, not in a fake bypass way, but like there's literally nothing to bang up against or trigger or there's nothing to prove. There's nothing to show. There's nothing to teach. It's just like, okay, you know, like meeting whatever's there. And then you come out of the jujitsu role <laughs> and it's like, Bleh! it's transformed because it wasn't resisted. It was called towards, you know? And that level of nothing, nothing is a problem. We don't have to hold on to our pain. We don't have to narrate our lives through a, a healing journey or the story of our suffering or the story of what we're ashamed about in ourselves, all of which is completely normal, you know? So that's not a problem either. <laughs> I'm not saying like, hey, shake it off, right? Like, but, but what I am saying is that, um, sometimes the path, you know, and certainly for me, it can become the endless healing journey. And what happens about with that, actually, I think I have a quote from that in my scrawl that is very hard to read. Oh, he said, the ego says, I've endured hardship and now it's mine to fix. <laughs> and that's how it perpetuates problems is that it's always saying like, I have something to fix. And, you know, at the very end of the retreat, he was talking about like, give a little thought to like who you are in addition to your path, your healing journey, or who are you at the end of your healing? Give a little thought to the idea that it, it could end. It's not who you are forever. Otherwise, you keep looking for it. You keep, you, you need that narrative to sustain your existence, right? And it's totally unconscious in an innocence. I'm somebody who, um, like a lot, of people and like a lot of people listening really, really, really wired around the identity of the suffering one and the identity of the healing one. And at a certain point, I could just, you know, it, it's reaching for itself because it's this reflexive movement. You know, what are we still healing? What are, and it's like, who are you if you're not healing something is a pretty profound question to sit with. Who are you if you're not healing something? Well, I think it's useful to to reflect on the fact that it that comes from an ego that thinks you still have to earn your worth. Right. Right? So there's this sense of do I deserve, which we've spoken about. And so the ego keeps saying, well, I've endured this and then all of these, this shakeout has happened and now I have fear and now I have guilt and now I have self-doubt. So I have to earn my worth by fixing it, right? It's almost like I'm going to run a triathlon and prove that my body is as strong as I hope it is. You know, the ego gets the sense that we have to get in and we have to be the ones to fix it only we really don't fix anything at the level of ego. And, and, you know, I've seen this over and over again, because when I sit with clients and when I've been in my own process, like when the pressure cooker's high and I'm in therapy, or if I've been talking to Kieran or something, what I've witnessed is when change happens, there's this real organic quality to it. Like you couldn't see it coming. Like it doesn't come in those moments where you're like, okay, let me interrupt every thought I have and then do this right. thing where I say, I love you so that I counteract it. Right. That's not how it happens. It's like you woke up and one day you didn't take things personally anymore. And you're like, who is this person? I always would take this personally. I mean, I see this in clients all of the time. The, the best cases are when 
they're telling you a story and they don't even realize that they are completely relating to life differently than they ever have before because it's so natural because the change just arose. It took them over. There wasn't even a, you know, a notice, like someone tacked on their door, like change has been here. It's right. just, you know, <laughs> it's new. Yeah. Right. And now all of a sudden they're seeing and experiencing life through this new way, this new being. And so that's really how change happens. And you'll hear people use the word grace and you'll hear people use the word like, you know, universe and divine timing. Um, we so hate the idea that we can't control this process and mercy to us. We hate it because it's painful. The problem is we can't control this process. And so the thinking that says, I'm going to get myself out of this by earning my worth, by fixing everything, is actually one of the main problems. It's that fucked up human thing right. where it's like, that's what's keeping it going because of one of the things you just pointed to, Brooke, like we keep reflexing back. So am I okay? Am I okay? Am I okay? How about now? Am I good? Am I bad? Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I safe? Am I unsafe? You know, am I happy? Am I full? Like we keep reflexing back and in some level look hard enough, you know, there's always something there, but also because we keep turning towards the wrong voice, the, uh, the aspect of ourselves that cannot possibly fix it. It's like Matt said, the ego always dies of failure. Mm. I think John Prendergast said something very similar to that because it's set up to think it can do something that it can't even do. Right. Yeah. He, yeah. John did point that out. And Matt did, gave right? a great story. Like if you could relate to that voice, the checking in voice as like you're staying at a hotel and it's the hotel staff. <laughs> so this is all totally a Matt Con story that I'll um, share here from our weekend. And the hotel staff keep you check in, you get in your room and about 30 seconds later, you hear a knock on the door and it's the hotel staff. How you doing in there? Um, good. Just got here. Just checked in doing good. Thank you. Thanks for checking in. Oh, absolutely. No problem. And then, you know, 15 seconds later, the hotel staff <laughs> knocks on the door, knock, knock, knock. How are you, sir? Everything's still okay? You're okay? still okay? Yeah, I'm still okay. Really? Abs totally good. It's only been 15 seconds. Just unpacking my bags. And it keeps coming back, keeps coming back. How are you doing, sir? Um, at a certain point, it's like, you know, I'm great, except you keep interrupting me <laughs> when I'm trying to just be in my room. I just got here. Stop fucking interrupting and asking me if I'm okay. And like, it was such a, Matt also uses humor so skillfully, so funny. And like, it's such a disarming way to think about this because of course the thing that ego does is it co-ops it and then it's like, Oh, now that's bad, right? Like now the right. way that I self-reference and check in on myself is bad. Now the way that I make things a problem is bad. And that's another way of making that a problem. And it just, and on and on and on it goes, this is the habit of the ego. But if you can just take it in this much lighter, much more humorous way, like it's the hotel staff that in this like completely obsessive, insane way keeps knocking on the door when oh, you're fucking fine. You're just unpacking your bags. You just got there. It just disarms it. Well, I mean, and the hotel staff only wants to serve you. Right. But you see how they're not maniacal. Uh, yeah. You, you can they see where the serving. problem lies, right? Like, are you thirsty? Is it, are you thirsty? I heard a noise. Is everything okay? You feeling okay? <laughs> Do you have enough towels? Yeah, I've got plenty of towels. Are you sure? I mean, would you like a sixth towel? <laughs> I think this is very common with um, HSPs. So mm. for the sensitive crowd, I mean, it's actually when you read Elaine Aaron's work on highly sensitive people, it's one of the indicators is that they're highly self-referential. Mm. So it's this natural kind of reflex. It's almost like you're feeling all of these things happening in your environment and you keep turning to yourself to see, are you okay? Did you do something? Do you have to learn something from this? Is there something that went awry? Is there something you can do better? Mm -hmm. And so this seems to be very, very dominant in people who have high levels of empathy and sensitivity. Now, 
throw trauma into the mix. Mm. And I think that reflex can can become really the dominant thought stream. Oh yeah, absolutely the dominant thought stream. I'll speak for I myself. Mean, I mean that was a big hyper vigilance. Hyper vigilance. And I think anyone who's studied anything on on trauma therapy, certainly you and I know this all too well, Brooke, is aware that anyone who's grown up in any kind of traumatic upbringing, something that was unpredictable, something that was highly uncomfortable, you can become hyper vigilant watching your environment for all of the signs that something might arise that's chaotic or dangerous. But this is like a kind of spiritual hyper vigilance where you're like, Am I going off course? Am I being a bad person? Have I been nice enough? Was I nice enough to my mom just now? Was I not forgiving enough? And that even that, where what you're aiming to do is free yourself from pain through being a good person. And that sounds not bad, right? Mm -hmm. Only you recognize that it's built on some false and painful ideologies like I have to be a good person, as in there's a way to be a bad human being, as in I have to earn my sense of worth. Now, most people who are self-reflecting like this, not bad human beings. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> These are not the people who are committing These aren't heinous the ones crimes. We're worried about. No. Yeah. There's usually an opposite <laughs> mechanism happening there. Right? Right. So just the fact that you're reflecting this much and this often probably points to you already being in the human condition, quite, quite a stellar human being. Mm. <laughs> then we have, of course, this deeper level we can hold from the spiritual perspective about people's basic goodness, that the problem is we just don't trust in it. Like we have this low confidence for our goodness, mm. this kind of self-effacing way of owning what our goodness is. And so this self-reflexive motion starts to get us caught in these loops around there's a way I have to be, the ego has to figure it out, and then it has to fix it, and it has to make us be that way. And of course, it's not working. And the other genius quote I think Matt shared was, if it's not working now, it won't work later. Right. Yeah. If it's not working <laughs> now, okay, yeah. goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, duh. we do that all the time. I'm wondering if we can think of an example. I, I don't want to use the weekend, right? Because I don't want to share other people's stories. And I don't have, I didn't ask Matt a question and, and kind of sort of neither did you. <laughs> you asked a question about not having a question. Um, and I don't want to share other people's stories because that feels like a violation of their stuff. But I'm trying to think of an example of, because what happens is the mind is like, well, then how do I do that? Like, what does that look like? And a part of what was so healing about this weekend um, like we're no strangers to this path. Um, but watching somebody who has a very, very, very high skill level at nothing is a problem and welcoming and everything with love and without resistance, um, was really transformative. Like just seeing that that's the process we can go in through internally instead of this constant punitive self reflexive loop. Um, I think John Prendergast's work can be sure. I mean, even though it's not just a story that we're giving, but you know, you can even share the story again that you shared with John Prendergast, um, around how you gave yourself some space and went into your heart. And then you had a whole new experience that wasn't about your ego fixing it because, right. you know, many of you commented that you also had a mic drop moment when John Prendergast was talking about how we can meet ourselves. And he was like, you know, you have to meet it as if this part can be there forever mm -hmm. and never change. And it would be fine. And it was like, wait, what forever? Yeah. And Matt also had that same approach. Like you literally can stay this way forever and I still love you and you're still utterly welcome. Yeah. And I think where we can start to relate, like, so what can we do with that? So I got two things out of this, um, at least that I have right now in my mind. So one thing was, the state shift is what enables you. We mm. all have an awakened part of ourselves. All of us have an awakened part that knows it's whole, is connected to everything. It's impossible not to be. Right. If you're alive, 
Yeah. You have that as the ground of your being. Ground if of you're your alive. being. alive. <laughs> Only our, our focal attention is often not there, right? We're just often not um, bringing that into the foreground of our attention. So one thing I noticed is oftentimes we're trying to meet something in our lives. So let's say I feel ashamed that I feel like, why can't I ever be nicer to my mom? I mean, by the way, I'm pretty nice to my mom. (laughs) I know, but I think that the, the mom, especially the mother daughter thing, but parents in general, this is a very common, sticky, very common. Yeah. So the funny part is in reality, I'm very nice to my mom, but in my mind, if I'm impatient, if I snip at something, if I don't let her do the manipulative behavior she may be doing without mentioning that, like, please, mom, then I'm, a, I'm, I've done bad. Why can't I be a more tolerant, patient person? Okay. So let's just use this as the example. So the typical way that this goes down, my observer is always active. So I observe, Ooh, I sounded like I had a tone when I responded to my mom. Then I have this thought, I wish I was a nicer person. Then it goes, why can't I just be nicer to my mom? Then it goes, what the fuck is the matter with you? You've been doing this stuff. Why can't you be nicer to your mom? Right. And then some emotions get stirred. I feel guilty, then kind of angry, sort of stressed, tense. And it goes through this whole cycle till somehow almost miraculously, probably because I vent to my husband or something, somehow the cycle wears itself out like exhausts itself and it disappears. So that's like a normal arc I might go through. So in that arc, you can see what's happening is the ego saying, here's this problem, right? So it's checking in on me. Am I a good daughter? Am I a bad daughter? Which is basically equivalent in my mind to a good person, bad person. So it's checking in on me and then it determines bad person. You had not enough patience. And it's holding on to the spiritual superego, which says, if you're a good person, you will have patience, forgiveness, kindness, compassion. So it's categorized me. And then it goes through its let me teach Vanessa a lesson stage where it's like, let me tell you all the ways you're bad, because this is really going to work this time where if I tell you, you're going to change, right? So that's like the common experience. What I got from sitting in this weekend in an even more profound way, you and I have spoken about this and I've gotten it, but it landed was from that level of thinking, I can't change the conversation. So from the level at which I'm in survival mode, my ego thinks it has to fix it. My ego thinks I am someone to fix. So all of those implications that are built into that whole arc, I come in and I try to fix it at the same level that it's dysfunctioning. Right. So I come in and try to fix it from the ego fixer who, again, assumes I have a problem and this is a problem. Right. So the ego is doing its thing. And then I come in and I smack down the ego with the ego's bad. And then the whole thing just keeps spinning. When we were sitting with Matt, part of his energy, I think part of the energy medicine available in the room, part of how he worked with people, as you pointed to, Brooke, I think part of the mantras, thank God I'm me and I love you. Um, it shook something loose until you were in a state of love. Right. Like we were in samadhi. We were in a state where peace and joy and love were natural. They're just a part of the fabric of that state. So then it was easy to look and be like, there's no such thing as shame. I mean, it was like the the most kind of funny thing from that state. All of a sudden, softness for yourself bubbles over. Now, of course, since we're not all going to sit with Matt Kahn for long weekend retreats, it's like, what do I do? Well, this is where I think John Prendergast's work is really, really helpful because John, I think in his conversation with us, Mm -hmm. certainly in his book and in other ones of his writings and interviews, basically points out to us that that is always available. And it's just a matter of seeing if you can't make contact with the part of yourself that already knows you're whole, already knows everything's okay, you're good, it's good. And every person that I've worked with this with can. Mm -hmm. And John said the same thing, people can every time. 
Yeah. Because yeah. it's you and it's right. there. Yeah. And then from there, once you can make contact with that, I think you can have a different relationship to that whole arc. But you can't have a different relationship to that whole um, inner dialogue when you're coming from the level of ego, I can fix it, I have to make myself better. Right. And at the place that you're talking about where those things dissolve, it, it starts to become hilarious or, or sweet or tender, depending yes. that, that you ever thought you needed to be different or that you ever thought your mom needed to be different. It's like, what? And I remember, you know, Matt this weekend talking about coming to peace with his own mother, uh, on her passing and just having this moment of like, you know, who the fuck am I? To say you ever should have been a different kind of mom than you actually were. You know, like if God. When you were doing the best you could too. Right. I mean, said, that's yeah. how it goes. It's almost like if God was is writing the movie, like that's how the movie got written. I don't fucking know why. You know, like it just is. That's how that went, you know. So God bless. Like that's the story of her life. Why? I don't know why. It's the mystery. It's not up to me to decide who she should be. And it's not up to me to decide who I should be in the presence of that either, right? Like, so at a certain point, it just falls away. And it's like, this is the movie that I'm watching. This is how this goes. And suddenly, like, the problem falls away. Oh, look, this is what's happening in the movie now. And that can, of course, as all things can be taken as a bypass where you, like, uh, detach from your life, right? And watch it from a great distance. So I don't mean it in that way. It's more like you're in the movie and you're like, oh, wow, um, and Matt's next book coming out is titled everything is here to help you. And like, that says a lot, like, what if you took that perspective, right? That instead of why can't I be different? Why can't they be different? Why can't this situation be different? What is the gift in this situation? You know, what is the, and there was something he had talked about too. I wonder if I can find the quote in my little funny thing, but like, Saying it's not fair is a way of saying life gave you something and you did not accept the invitation. <laughs> I'm like, that's fucking powerful, right? Because like we all have our that's not fair moments. But what if instead of it's not fair, it's not fair that my mom can't meet my needs. It's not fair that I can't be the super tolerant, compassionate, bestest daughter ever. What if instead it's just like, Life is giving you a, a gift. You can accept the invitation, in which case you're in the movie going, oh, look, this is how the movie's written. <laughs> or you can reject the invitation, in which case you're stuck in, it's not fair, which is a painful place to live, you know, and then the suffering wheel just goes on and on. Yeah, what he said was to say it's unfair means I wouldn't be using it as an invitation to grow and evolve. Mm. And right. seeing it as the gift that you're pointing to. I mean, it's probably useful to also add that discussion Matt was having about his mother was a forgiveness practice. Yeah. And his heart was so open in that moment, which is what I think love just does. So as you enter a state of love, then your heart's open. So there was a way that he could forgive himself for ever thinking she needed to be more. Right. Like so and, sweet. Yeah. And then also forgive her for not ever being enough mm -hmm. and that everything was okay. Yeah. You know, all of it was okay. And like this and seems to be the human experience that we've been having together. It's a much simpler, I notice this is the dance we did. Well, you know, I, I think that leads me to also reflecting on strength. Mm. So one of the things I got for myself and being in that room was how strong we can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, Matt's strength is palpable and it's not a strength born of fight. It's not a fight energy. It's, no, there's not it's a the defense. the exact opposite of that. It's the exact opposite. It's the, once you are in love enough, then nothing really can hurt you. And you and I have spoken about this, which doesn't mean nothing's painful. It's not that. It's just nothing can ever be taken away from you. Right. And as your conviction um, builds that life is a gift, that everything is a gift, that the universe has a benevolence and it's working for you, 
that you are a part of this beautiful benevolent universe that is inextricable and absolutely adored just as you are. And as you are entering into a state of love, which really in some ways can begin as your nervous system shifts into parasympathetic. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good entryway into love um, or the breath, which we can talk about. But as that happens and you're in love, then these natural states of, I don't have to hold this grudge against my mom. I'm strong enough to let it go. And I don't have to hold on to all my painful memories so that I don't let them happen again. I'm strong enough to be with whatever arises. Right in the moment. And I don't have to hold on to the fact that I was heartbroken so that I guard my heart on a physical and energetic level so it never happens again. I can give my whole heart. And even if it doesn't go the way that I wish it would go, I can handle it. Yeah. And part of why I, I've already been coming to my own strength for so long this was just a deeper, more solid sense of it. But part of why I think it's important to illuminate is that many, many sensitive, kind people don't even begin to know the depths of their own strength. It's like, in fact, we can go the opposite way. We can start to coddle ourselves like I'm not OK and I can't eat this and I can't do that and I can't spend time with too many people and like around these many people. And that's pretty normal and it's fine. And sometimes that level of awareness is the useful level of awareness. But in that whole process, we can start to see ourselves as more fragile than we are. And not recognize that oh, this is going to sound crazy for me coming out of my own mouth, but like we are God walking around in bodies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're no separate than that mountain or that tree that conveys that sense of, oomph, you know, and energy and grace and no different than the tornado blowing through or the ground shaking. And so we have it in us just as like the earth can tolerate these storms and go on. It doesn't mean that when the fires roll through, the trees aren't charred. And yet, you know, life remains. And so I think to begin to tap into our own strength is, is a way that we can fuel our resiliency to actually be alive, like we were talking about last week, like to want to be alive. Because in a way, I think whenever I've been afraid of stepping into my aliveness, it's out of fear, I can't handle it. Yeah. Yeah. That it'll be too much or any of those things. There was some theme I was going to come to about, oh, we were talking about, you were talking about the nervous system shift, because I do think that like one of the really important things, or one of the really useful things is the understanding that these things and if we, and if we look in our lives, it's not like one day this is how it will go. This is how it has always gone <laughs> is that things let go of you. You don't let go of them. Things heal themselves. Epiphanies arise. Opportunities arise. Something lands, you know, like that's always how it goes. Like you were saying. And, you know, the land where that happens more and with more ease and with less suffering is the land of, um, uh, content nervous system, which, you know, he did a lot of pointing towards this weekend, which was very helpful and just talked about the breath, talked about also be, be settled, you know, like not settle for less the way we use that word oftentimes, but like settle, just land, you know, just do the next thing in the movie, like in real time, I mean, not jump out ahead. The breath conversation, which as with all of these conversations, we're touching like one ice crystal on the iceberg. <laughs> it was a very profound weekend. So I just want to convey that again, but um, very helpful to the way he pointed to the breath, which so many spiritual paths and meditation traditions and yogic traditions do. But he's, in his way, kept it super simple, super practical, super tangible. And he was just saying that, um, you know, slow, deep breath 
is going to allow you to be, you know, in these states of samadhi and oneness and that, you know, if we're with someone else who has a more overstimulated nervous system and they have the sort of faster, shallower breathing, that being triggered is, well, first of all, that one of the things we do as empaths is we match the breath patterns of the people around us. But we're oftentimes the ones who can also f- find our way to holding a very deep, resonant, rich breath, you know, a parasympathetic breath. So being triggered is when we get pulled out of our deeper breath and we match the overstimulated shallow breather around us. Um, that feels like, ah, you know, we're triggered. It's one of the ways we're triggered. And healing happens when we are able to maintain being the, you know, dominant, I don't mean dominator, but dominant (laughs) breath that is deeper and people can match our pattern, you know, and that we can be in their presence and maybe they're, you know, going through something or flitting all about and that we can just hold that deep breath. That if we can have deep, slow, peaceful breath, we actually can't get pulled into the storylines and the being, ref- you know, reflexively looking back and all those things, which is so funny, right? Because it's like traditions for thousands of years are like, be with your breath. But I with know. any of these teachings, it's like you can take in a tiny little phrase like that, be with your breath. And if you really take it in and live it for, you know, and just let it really unfold all the way to home, it's like, oh, oh, oh. I just have to do that. Like if I do, if I can manage to do just that one thing more of the time, my life will change because I won't be in my own self-reflexive state, creating problems, living in the stories, looking for my pain, being triggered by the people around me. Why are they? And then getting in judgment. Why are they so, you know, or any of those things. Oh, so simple. Also, I remember not so simple. No, I mean, and (laughs) You'll get the level of the teaching that you're ready for. Mm -hmm. It's profoundly kind. It's like Matt said, like, why would you want to throw a fourth grader and like a 10th graders curriculum, right? Like the universe will give you what you're ready for, you know, that'll be exactly what you need to work with. So when we've heard breath teachings before, you know, we got it at the level that we got it at. And then all of a sudden you hear him say, and you're like, the breath, of course. Like, <laughs> it's so easy. I yeah. can be with Samadhi. I can really be with oneness. I just have to be connected to my breath. <laughs> right. Ta-da. 20 years of breath work later. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh, breath matters. This thing I've been thinking about for 20 years. Oh, it's so silly. It's so silly because, you know, it's with everything. These things are almost futile to convey because of the ability to co-opt something and turn it into something. So even the breath, the ego can like take it and be like, I'm going to breathe a really good breath. (sighs) Yeah. (laughs) Is this deep enough? Am I in bliss yet? (laughs) And I'll never let anybody take me off my breath, which is just an armoring. And then you have to tighten up your (laughs) diaphragm muscles, you know, we're so delightful. (laughs) I know we are. Mercy to the humans, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we can only just forgive and enjoy the fact that we're human beings, that would already go so far. You know, like let go of this idea of self-improvement, the myth that we must fix ourselves. I mean, especially all of you listening I mean, we are, we are the thoughtful ones and I don't mean it in any kind of judgmental way, but we are the ones who are the deepest, the most in contact with consciousness. And, um, and yet we can be the cruelest to ourselves really funnily. Um, so I think when we think about the parasympathetic, cause it was funny when he was talking about the breath, which I can feel. And when you're sitting across from someone, be it, um, a yoga teacher or, you know, your therapist or a spiritual teacher, um, you know, that they can carry the kind of most intensive energy stream and you sync with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how bodies are designed. Babies sync with their mother's breath and heartbeat. We're designed for that. That's the beauty of connection is that we can take each other into peace. And so it's quite lovely. And I know that 
for myself though, when I'm really out of my breath, like if I'm caught and my breath is taut and it's tense, sometimes it can be hard for me on my own Mm -hmm. to find that restorative breath that actually opens up this new state, right? This parasympathetic state, but really this state of samadhi or peace. So there's other things that can do it gardening outside on a really sunny day and just breathing in the smells. Um, You can do restorative yoga. Listen to Jeannie Zandi's um, (laughs) benevolent thief meditation. Uh, Go go listen to sound bowls. You know, sit with someone else who finds their breath really easy and can like help you and train again. Because, you know, I had this... um, this guy I met in Bali, I've spoken about a few times on different episodes. And, uh, he had mentioned that I had told him that I was a psychologist and I was doing life coaching. And he was like, Oh no, that's terrible. Everyone's going to get caught in their delusions. You all think stories matter. And like, it's not who you are. And that's such a common spiritual refrain though. He was a very clear energy worker, but I was like, Oh yeah, blah, blah, blah. But like, clearly I've been served by talking to people and clearly people are served by talking to me. So it seems oversimplified, but what he really pointed to was this. He said, first, help the body find a state of balance chemically. Second, learn to breathe. Third, look at your conditioned patterns. And what I'm getting now from this even deeper level of understanding is, of course, what he's talking about is supporting oneself or supporting others in accessing the part of us that knows ease and peace and love. And then four. And then turning towards <laughs> the other aspects of self, the conditioning with that love, mm. but not operating from our conditioning, trying to love our conditioning because it's a never ending loop and it's doomed to fail, which the ego takes as further evidence that we're just broken. Right. But it's impossible. So in short, we cannot at all convey (laughs) this weekend. I mean, we talked about some resonant things, but I guess towards the end here, I just want to circle back to saying like, so we can become retreat junkies too, right? Like in heal, just the way we can become healing junkies and like, go have some big, amazing, important experience, you know? So that's not what I'm trying to convey. Like go have the big, important, amazing experience. But as nervous systems that are trying to to find our way home to being, um, being in the presence of somebody who is a master at being is so nourishing and it can't be conveyed in words, you know, this way. And you and I are both really, really in the midst of like the beginning of metabolizing sounds maybe too effortful, but like the unfolding of, of whatever else will continue to shape shift from the weekend. Um, So, you know, find the, like, if you're called, (laughs) find the places where you can go. Like you were saying, there are other things you can do just locally, like go to your amazing restorative yoga class, do, do whatever you do, but wherever you're called, see if you can sort of set your divining rod to find things that allow you to rest into yourself more. To not, oh, that was the thing that Matt ended the weekend with, like the ego needs to anticipate something. And like the ego is not a problem, but at a certain point, it really hurts to be constantly anticipating something, whether it's anticipating something good or something bad, it lives in anticipation. So if you can find something, whether going to a weekend like this with someone like Matt, who's a master level being ninja, (laughs) or, you know, you're going to do the things you do locally, um, move in the direction of softening. Our culture poo-poos this endlessly. It doesn't think it takes you anywhere. Really let yourself be, have the lullaby of the softened, the relaxed, the resting, the settled nervous system, because then life gets to do itself. You know, then these things start to emerge and it just becomes less effortful. And I would think that 
a large majority of the people who are listening to this show are listening to it because like we're tired. You know, we all hit that point on the path where we're like, I'm tired. You know, <laughs> this is fatiguing. I'm tired of suffering. I'm tired of efforting. I'm tired of striving. I'm tired of shaming myself. Um, and the direction is not getting a hold of ourselves more. It's deeply, deeply landing here and softening, resting. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. The show notes, including any of the resources that we mentioned, live at Bliss and Grit, and they'll be within the post for this specific episode. Our member platform, which provides a lot of support and benefits for joining, um, as well as surprise treaties, like we were just on retreat, so we dropped some of the notes from Matt Kahn in there in the forum. That's at patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Um, if you want to engage with the topics in a deeper way, it's a nice place to be for a more immersive experience of the show. We're also, of course, on Instagram and Facebook, or you can subscribe on the website, listengrit.com, and there's a Friday digest that goes out. Many of you have written very kind reviews already so far, which we're so grateful for. Here's one from Susan Pack. Bliss and Grit is the reminder that while we are on this windy, weird, amazing, beautiful, sometimes hard, sometimes soft spiritual path, that we are human and we are not alone. I can't stop recommending this podcast to my sensey friends. You two are amazing. Thank you. And thank you so much, Susan. And we'll be back next week. <laughs>